Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to review another mini PC. This is the UM790 from Minis Forum. Now this has a 7000 series chip inside, it's the 7940HS. Now this is similar to what you would find in like the ROG Ally or another mini PC that I reviewed recently called the GTR7 from B-Link. However, this one does have some different features and a different power profile as well. It also comes in a little bit cheaper than the B-Link one too. So we're going to take a look at this one and also compare it against the GTR7 in case you are looking for one of those higher end mini PCs. Now starting with this video, we're going to do something unique as well. This is the Razer Core X Chroma. It's an eGPU enclosure. It's super big and heavy as you can see, but I do want to start using this with my mini PC and handheld reviews, at least for the devices that do support it. And so we're going to start that with this video here. And I'm also going to do a dedicated video soon about just the whole experience of getting one of these and whether or not it's going to be worth it. Anyway, we got a lot of ground to cover here. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, as always, let's get started with the specs. Like I mentioned, this is using a Ryzen 7940HS. And as I'm making this video, this is the absolute best CPU that you can buy right now with integrated graphics. It comes with eight Zen 4 cores and 16 threads. This comes with DDR5 RAM clocked at 5600 megahertz. For storage, we have two M.2 2280 PCIe 4.0 slots. And we've got a wide variety of video output. We have two different HDMI 2.1 ports, the first I've ever seen in a mini PC, and it also has two USB 4 ports that are capable of video out. For connectivity, we have Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2, and it's running Windows 11 Pro. Now it's running a power profile of 60 watts, but it will turbo boost to 65 here and there. And if you'd like, you can go into the BIOS and clock it to a full 65 as well. Now in terms of pricing, one of my favorite things about Mini's Forum is that they offer a bare bones unit. This means you'll add your own RAM and storage, but you'll get a lower price. So it's gonna be $520 if you buy it that way. And of course, if you want them to add the RAM and the storage, you can pay for that here as well. And the price will go all the way up to close to $800, depending on if you get it fully spec'd out. Either way, that's one of my favorite things about this company is that they give you this option in case you already have some of those components. Now this is a review unit sent to me over by the manufacturer and there are some differences here between the final release. For example, the model I'm looking at right here only has 16 gigs of RAM, although they offer only 32 as the baseline. What this means is the performance you see in here may actually be worse than the retail units if you buy one. Either way, looking inside, we have an HDMI cable and also a couple rubber feet in case you need to replace them. The power supply here is pretty standard from them. It's 120 watts and it is fairly big. And then finally, it also comes with a Visa mount and screws if you want to mount this on the back of a monitor. Now, looking at the mini PC itself, it has a nice subdued and pretty sleek look altogether. The entire thing is covered in aluminum and it feels really premium in the hand. Let's go ahead and take a look at the components, starting with the front. On the left, we have a CMOS reset button and then an LED indicator when you turn the device on. And then of course our power button and then two USB 4 ports. And these can be used for a variety of use cases, including an external GPU. And then finally, further down, we have a headphone microphone jack. On the sides, we just have a bunch of ventilation as you can see right here. And so now let's take a look at the back. On the far left, we have our power input and then those two HDMI 2.1 ports. These are gonna be capable of 4K at 144 Hertz. Next, we have 2.5 gigabit ethernet and then four USB A ports that are rated for 3.2 Gen 2. Now overall, I think the hardware design here is good, but I do have one minor complaint. And that is, I wish there was more variety when it came to the ports on the front and the back. For example, our USB-C ports are only on the front, and so plugging in something really quickly like transferring files with an SSD, that's going to be fine. However, as I'll show later, when you're plugging something more robust in, like an eGPU cord, it's just a little bit weird to have it coming out of the front. I think it would look better hidden in the back. And so personally, if I had the choice, I would rather have one of each of them on each side. I think that's going to allow you to organize things just a little bit better. Anyway, looking at the bottom here, this is the only plastic component of the whole device, and it's got a lot of ventilation down here as well. Now looking at the other side, you can see there's a rubber gasket around the top right here, but the top is made out of aluminum. So let's go ahead and open it up and have a look inside. First thing you'll notice, you do have to remove those rubber feet, which is probably why they give you a couple of replacements. After that, you have four different Phillips head spring loaded screws to remove. From there, you can use a guitar pick to just go around the sides and undo the clamps. And there's also a fan attached to the motherboard that you will need to unhook yourself. This is pretty easy. You just have to pull it right out. And it looks like this fan is there to cool off the RAM in particular. 
Now looking inside, this was kind of strange. They had two different M.2 SSDs, both 256 gigs. I asked the company about this and they said that the retail units will just come with a single 512 gig stick. And they use this for their engineering unit right here to test a RAID setup. So that's why I have these two smaller drives. Either way, you can also see we have dual channel RAM right here, rated at 5,600 mega transfers per second. And the other thing of note is they do have cooling attached to both the SSDs as well as the fan for the RAM. So let's go ahead and test out that cooling profile and see how hot the device is gonna get. At idle, you can see it's about 39 degrees Celsius, nice and cool. So let's go ahead and run a CPU intensive task like Cinebench. Now when first turning this on, it would boost up to 65 watts in terms of the CPU power, but after a couple of minutes, it did drop back down to a more stable 60. And you can see the temperature spiked at 90 degrees Celsius, but it never went beyond that. It mostly leveled out at about 88, 89 degrees altogether. Now, while we have the computer under a heavy load right here, let's take a listen to the fan noise. And for reference, I'm gonna push down on a controller button just so you can get a feel of how it's gonna sound. Overall, I would say the fan noise here is pretty good. It is noticeable, but it's not that loud. It's not distracting in any way. And it's definitely quieter than like pushing down on buttons on a controller. In terms of the final Cinebench score, we're looking at 16,833. This is about 200 points better than the B-Link one I tested earlier. And really anything over 16,000 is gonna be a pretty good score. So I would say they're just about neck and neck, at least when it comes to this one benchmark. Now this computer is so powerful, I'm not even gonna worry about things like video playback. It's gonna run all those things just great. Instead, I'm gonna jump directly into games and we'll focus mostly on the high-end stuff. However, starting at the very bottom here with Hades, you can see a 1080p default settings is playing at 60 frames per second, no problem. And you can even bring it up to a little bit more 3D based games like Risk of Rain 2. Same thing here, 1080p medium settings, we're getting well above 60 frames per second, really about an average of 80. In Grand Theft Auto 5 here, we're gonna play at 1080p under normal settings, which is kind of like a mix of medium and low. And you can see with V-Sync off, we are getting about an average of 90 frames per second. So this is gonna be super good. And if you do wanna play some games in higher frame rates, you can definitely do that. So for example, here with Grid, I'm playing it at 1080p low settings so I can max out the frames per second. And yeah, it's getting 120 plus the whole time. And given the fact that we have HDMI 2.1, this is definitely something you could do if you have a high refresh rate monitor. Speaking of high refresh rates, if you wanna play a competitive shooter like Counter-Strike Go, this is gonna work great. I got an average of about 220 frames per second, way above what my monitor can handle, but all the same, it's pretty cool that it can play this no problem. Moving over to what I would consider the Xbox 360 era of games like Bioshock Infinite, here I can play at 1080p high settings and we're getting well above 100 frames per second. Now moving on to former AAA titles, we're gonna start with Control. This is at 1080p low settings, and we're getting well above 40 frames per second right here, which is pretty impressive without a graphics card. So I would just lock this in at 40 right here and just enjoy it as it is. Moving over to Rise of the Tomb Raider, this is surprising in that with 1080p low settings, which is not the lowest setting you have available in this game, we're actually getting something pretty close to 60 frames per second. I would say the average is more like 50, 55, but all the same, this is really impressive, again, without a graphics card. For Doom Eternal, at 1080p in medium settings, we can get a stable 60 frames per second. This actually plays and feels really good. And another game that was really impressive was Resident Evil 3. Here I am playing at 1080p low settings. I turned V-Sync off just to see how far the frames per second could go, and I'm getting an average of about 90 frames per second. And bear in mind, this is with FSR turned off, so this is a really great gameplay experience right now. Moving over to more recent games, we'll start with Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'm using high textures and low shadows right here, and I'm getting an average of 60 frames per second when not in combat. However, once the fight starts, it will dip down to about the mid 50s altogether. Personally, I still think this is playable, but if you wanted to reduce the settings, you could probably lock this at 60. For Elden Ring, the most important thing for me is to get a stable frame rate above 30 frames per second. And you can see here at 1080p medium settings, this actually can do the job. So that's also very impressive for this game. I also found that Marvel's Spider-Man did really well with this APU. At 1080p with low settings, I got an average well above 40 frames per second. I would get a dip here and there, but all the same, I would probably lock this at 40 and just enjoy it like that. Moving on, here is Witcher 3 at 1080p low settings. We're also getting well above 40 frames per second here, so I would probably use those same settings like I would with Spider-Man. And then finally, we have Cyberpunk 2077, 1080p with low settings. Here I'm getting an average pretty close to 50 frames per second, which is really impressive again. 
In the end, I would say that basically any PC game you want to play on this machine will be playable, but as long as you don't expect to get 60 frames per second with every game. But all the same, you can still get 1080p for all of them. So now let's go ahead and move over to emulation. We're just going to start with the high-end stuff and really push the performance. So starting with Burnout 2 on the GameCube, I'm using an unreasonable number right here, a 6x resolution which is way above 4k. And you can see it's playing at a full frame rate, no problem. And this was the same with any GameCube game that I tried, including F-Zero GX and Metroid Prime 2. Now I don't think that playing above 4x resolution really gives you any sort of net benefit when it comes to graphics, but this is a great demonstration to show that this is going to play GameCube and Nintendo Wii on Dolphin absolutely no problem here. Now Nintendo 3DS is harder to emulate than GameCube because it has those two screens it has to render at the same time. However, even then at a 4x resolution this still plays at full speed. You might get a dip here and there when shaders are caching, but altogether, yeah, this is going to be great. So this gives me the confidence that yes, this will play just fine with 3DS up scaled to at least a 4x resolution for most games. Moving over to Nintendo Wii U, for this one I upscaled everything I could to a 1080p resolution. Some games like Wind Waker HD already play at a native 1080p, but for all the others I had to upscale them, and even then these played really well. I would get some graphical glitches with Mario Tennis Ultra Smash, but there's probably a few things at play right here. Number one, we do not have official drivers for this chipset yet, and sometimes when you upscale certain games it will introduce graphical artifacts. Regardless, from a performance standpoint, you should be able to play any Wii U game at a 1080p resolution at a full frame rate. Now Breath of the Wild is the one exception, this is the hardest game to emulate on this system. But even then, at a 1080p upscale, we're getting between 55 and 60 frames per second most of the time. And that's going to be a very smooth gameplay experience, so this is going to be great. Now for the rest of my emulation testing here, I'm going to switch over to the studio setup. And so I'm going to be running all these games off of this SSD running through USB 4. Now for the controller, I'm actually using a new one. This one is called the GameSer G7 SE. This is a wired controller that comes out next week and actually has hall sensor sticks and triggers. And on top of that, this is officially licensed for Xbox, so you can use it on that console as well. And I'm hoping to squeeze out a review here pretty soon too. We'll start with PlayStation 2. Again, I'm going to bump this up to a 6x resolution. And I found that most PS2 games are going to play just fine even at this really high resolution here. Now some games like God of War 2 you do have to reduce down to a paltry 4x resolution instead. And this actually is still over 1440p and so it's a really high resolution here and it looks great. Yes, PS2 is going to be excellent on this device. Now the Sony system I was most excited for was not PS2, but actually PS3. This chip in particular has done really well with other models and so I wanted to test it here. And I was not surprised to find that the PS3 emulation on the UM790 Pro is really excellent too. When you push it up to some of those higher end 3D based games, you know, things like Prince of Persia, yeah, we're getting a full frame rate right here. And this is actually one of the hardest places to render in this entire game. Same thing with Devil May Cry, I was getting a very stable 30 frames per second throughout the entire game, and this is what it natively ran at. Now when we try to push it to some of those really high-end games, so like things like Ratchet and Clank Quest for Booty, this is a game that as long as you're over 30 frames per second, it'll feel really smooth. But to my surprise, I found that this was closer to 60 frames per second almost the entire time. Another game I like to test on these high-end systems is Infamous, and this one got an average of about 45 frames per second. Again, all we're really looking for is over 30 frames per second because anything under that will result in slowdown. So I think this is going to be a great game to play on this system too. Okay, next up we have Xbox 360 emulation. I only tried out a few games here, but these ones worked reasonably well. This emulator is still kind of a work in progress, and so compatibility will always be an issue, at least for right now. But as it stands, some of those heavier to play games like Project Gotham Racing 4 still played at full speed. So I think if you do want to dabble in Xbox 360 emulation, this will be a good choice here too. And finally, let's try out a little bit of Nintendo Switch emulation. We're going to start here with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and I'm playing this in docked mode, so the resolution here will be exactly the same as it was if you were playing a Nintendo Switch hooked up to your TV. I got a dip every once in a while when some shaders were compiling, but overall, yes, this one worked great. Same thing with Super Mario Odyssey, one of the harder games to play on Nintendo Switch from an emulation perspective. And again, as these shaders were compiling, I would get a dip every once in a while, but it's one of those things where the longer you play, the better it'll be. I always like showing off the beginning of these games, just so you can see how bad it's going to be, at least in the beginning. And as you can see, it's running great. Now there's one other Switch game that I get asked about a lot, so I wanted to show this here really quick. And this is a mysterious game that came out earlier this year, you've probably never heard of it. And bear in mind, I did a 1080p upscale, and so this is going to look a lot better than it would in docked mode. 
It does kind of struggle to maintain 30 frames per second, and a lot of that has to do with just how many shaders have to compile when you're going through this world. All the same, I think this is going to be a superior experience right here to then actually playing it on the Switch in docked mode. Okay, next up we're going to test out Batacera. This is a custom Linux firmware centered on retro gaming, and it can be booted from a flash drive. So I've put the flash drive in the back of the device here, and then through the recovery options, I've just told it to boot through the USB drive instead of the internal hard drive. Now I am using a test beta version of the most recent release, but yeah, it booted up just fine right here. And I just recently made a video about how to set up a retro gaming console like this using a mini PC and Batacera. I'll leave a link down below. And one of the major things I like to test when when I'm in Batacera is the performance with the original Xbox. This is one that always does better with Linux than it does on Windows. And you can see right here I'm getting a 4x resolution with Xbox and it's playing just fine. And so this is a really great sign. If you want to play original Xbox, I would recommend doing it here on Botticera. And of course, everything below that, including PlayStation 2 and GameCube, those are all going to play just great too. In general, what I recommend doing is playing all the way up to Wii U within Botticera. All these games are going to play just fine. And then for those higher end emulators, you know, things like Nintendo Switch, PS3, those emulators need to be constantly updated. So I do recommend using those in Windows. And so you can kind of get the best of both worlds right here. Wii U and below on a flash drive hooked up in the back, and then you can play your Switch and PS3 directly in Windows. Now, like I mentioned in the intro, we're going to try out an external GPU setup with this device since it has USB 4. And this GPU here is a 3060 Ti that I recently picked up to work with this eGPU. The setup here is pretty simple, but yeah, you can see this thing is massive. But it is kind of cool to be able to see your GPU spinning and it has some nice LED lights. I'll do a full review of this eGPU setup later on. Anyway, as you can see, yeah, it totally dwarfs the mini PC right here. And like I mentioned, it is kind of a bummer that you have to plug it in in the front. I think it would be really nice to have it discreetly plugged in in the back. Anyway, once you have it set up, there are a couple tricks you have to do. For example, you have to install the GPU drivers for it even to be recognized in the first place. And I'll talk about this more in detail in my actual review of the eGPU, but it does get pretty tricky, especially because I'm using an NVIDIA GPU with an AMD system. Either way, once I have the drivers installed, we were good to go. So let's go ahead and start doing some testing. For a baseline, I'm going to play the game without the GPU hooked up. So here is God of War at 1080p low settings. You can see I'm getting an average of about 45 frames per second, which is actually really impressive. This is a game I would probably just lock at 40 and enjoy like that. But of course, with the eGPU setup, you can really push the performance. So here I am running in 1080p again, just because that's the max of my monitor, but with ultra settings. And I'm getting an average of about 80 to 85 frames per second, so way above what I actually need to play. And to be honest, 1080p ultra is kind of overkill too. I would probably just play this game in high settings. Either way, yes, you can see there's a pretty significant bump from 1080p low all the way up to 1080p ultra, and I'm getting about double the frame rate as well. Let's try out another game. This is Destiny 2 right here. Now I had to play this at 900p at low settings. And that's because I usually prefer to get as close to 60 frames per second as I can with this game. And yes, at 900p low settings, you will get a pretty steady frame rate without that eGPU at 60 frames. However, you can bump it up quite a bit if you are going to use the eGPU. So here I'm running again at 1080p, but the highest settings possible. Again, this is probably overkill, but you're getting an average between 55 and 60 frames per second with these settings. Personally, I would probably just drop this down to high and then get a more stable 60 frames per second. And finally, another example I want to show here is Horizon Zero Dawn. This one I'm playing at 1080p low settings and getting an average of about 32, maybe 34 frames per second. Either way, you could definitely lock this at 30 and have a great experience. Meanwhile, I was surprised to find that this one did not have a significant increase in overall performance even with this eGPU hooked up. In fact, I was only able to bump it up to high settings and not ultra, and even then the average frame rate was about 45 frames per second. So there may be a couple things going on right now. This setup may not be very optimal for this specific game, but it also goes to show how well the UM790 performs even without an external GPU. Okay, with all that testing out of the way, let's go ahead and start summarizing what I like and what I don't like about the UM790 Pro. Number one, I love the fact that this thing is super compact. It's much smaller than the competition, and it hardly takes up any space on your desk whatsoever. When you combine that with the overall plain design, which I also really like, you end up with a mini PC that is super powerful, but just doesn't really look like it's very impressive. And so it's one of those mini PCs that really doesn't catch your eye, but all the same, it's packed with power. 
I also love the fact that it's using HDMI 2.1. I hope this is a standard going forward with these high-end mini PCs. There's not gonna be a ton of games you can play at 4K and 144 hertz, but I love the fact that they're actually paving the way for that right now. I also like the fact that we have six different USB ports on here, two USB 4 in the front, and then of course, four USB-A on the back. And of course, as I've shown for the majority of this video right here, the performance is just out of this world. When I tested my first mini PC about 18 months ago, I was super impressed with what I could do. And this thing is easily like four times more powerful. And so it's just kind of crazy how much these have advanced over the past couple of years. And I also think that the price for what you're getting here is pretty good. Of course, you can build a really big PC for much cheaper, but the fact that you can get this pretty well specced out for about $700 and there's a $500 bare bones option just gives you a lot of room to work with. We're finally getting to the point where these little mini PCs are starting to compete not only with performance, but then also with price with some of those bigger models. Now this thing isn't perfect, but I did find a couple things that I could nitpick, and it was pretty hard to actually find these. Number one, like I mentioned, I wish the ports were placed differently. For example, at least one of the USB 4 ports on the back would have been really great just so you can plug something up back there and not have it really sticking out of the front. And then I also did find this runs a little bit hotter than the other model. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But at a full load, we were seeing about 90 degrees Celsius. That's not super hot, like it's not actually making me worried. But this is definitely one of those concessions that happens when you make a mini PC so small. There's just not a lot of room for air circulation. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning of the review, I do want to do a quick comparison against this one right here. This is the B-Link GTR7. This one has a very similar chipset inside and also a similar price, and so I think it's worth detailing these two. And so this is what I came up with right here. Number one, the UM790 Pro does have the higher-end Ryzen 9 chip. But when you look at a spec sheet and also performance reports, it's a very similar difference between these two. And so performance here is going to be just about neck and neck. Now the UM790 Pro is definitely smaller than the GTR7 if size is a concern. But because the GTR7 is a little bit bigger, it does have better cooling. And so this one will run at an average of about 7 degrees Celsius lower at a maximum load. In terms of design, I really like the fact that the UM790 is pretty subdued. But if you want something that's a little bit more in your face, the GTR7 might work in that regard. There's actually four different color options, including an orange one if you really want to have something that's eye-catching. In terms of price, the GTR7 only has one model, 32 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. And the RAM speed between these two is the exact same. And right now, the GTR7 is $709 after you apply a coupon. However, with the UM790 Pro, this one is at $699 during its pre-release stage. And so price here is very similar between the two, but the one big advantage is the UM790 Pro has a bare bones option. And so if you have your own RAM or storage, you want to get them elsewhere, you can spend about $500 to get the UM790 just like that. And there's also some differences when it comes to features. For example, the GTR7 has this really nice fingerprint sensor. This allows you to log in really quickly, and it's one of the things I use most with my GTR7. However, I really do love the fact that the UM790 Pro has HDMI 2.1. And then finally, when it comes to ports, I think that the GTR7 got this one right because it has a mixture of ports available. It has both USB-A and USB-C on the front, and then also it has two USB-4 ports on the back, and I think that's just a better setup overall. So between the two, I think these are both great deals, and the price is going to be just about the same. It's really going to come down to what features and form factor you prefer. And if you want to get a feel for what other mini PCs you can get at various price points, I will leave a link to my mini PC spreadsheet. This has over 30 different models that I've tested over the past 18 months, and it's organized by price, and you can also see how it's going to perform with emulation systems. Anyway, at the end of the day, between these two devices at the high-end tier of mini PCs, I think I do actually prefer the UM790 Pro over the GTR7. And this was actually a pretty tough choice because I like these both a lot. But I think what makes the UM790 Pro stand out for me is the fact that it is nice and small and nondescript, but then also that HDMI 2.1 output on the back with 4K and 144 Hz just makes me feel like this is going to be more future-proof. Either way, if you've got a budget of about $700 and you want to get one of these high-end mini PCs, I don't think you can go wrong either way. But for me personally, I think the UM790 Pro is the one to beat. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Between these devices or other mini PCs, which one would you prefer? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.